Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk a bit about microservices, Docker, and, and service discovery. So, um, so just before I start, maybe a quick show of hands. Um, who's familiar with microservices here? Who, yeah, so maybe who doesn't know anything about microservices, maybe? Okay, so um, I'd say we're going we're gonna to learn as we go along. Um, and, so, and similarly, um, is everybody okay with Docker? Does everybody doesn't know anything about Docker? Okay, so I'm going to have a couple of slides at the start talking about microservices in Docker, and we're just going to go a bit, a little more into <coughs> just the practice stuff. Um, so, if you have any questions, just don't hesitate to just stop me at any stage. So, um, okay, let me turn this on. Right. So, um, I work for a company called Newsweaver. It's based in Cork. Um, we do um, an internet. We like our, our software is an internal comms uh, platform which is aimed at increasing employee engagement uh, through communication to the employees, uh, measuring the, the communication and the impact, and basically adapt to communication to ensure that communications goes down to the employees and that the feedback is taken into account. So that includes creating emails, managing internet content, um, exploring the, the options of um, enterprise social networks, and we work with very large companies, such as like Vodafone, Barclays, British Gas, so um, very, very large companies for very large employees based. Um, so first of all, what are microservices? So just to put it very simply, the microservices are very small services that are in the position with monolithic applications, which are one very large code base. Um, so. Small just it kind of simply means that they're responsible for one and one only and one and only thing. Um, they're loosely coupled, so it's kind of a clearly defined interface responsible for their own data. So a microservice might have its own, well, will have its own database if it needs one. But it will have a clear, a defined interface, which might be a REST interface. Um, uh, if it's a if it's synchronous, it might be over uh, messaging. If it's if it's asynchronous. Um, and the the big advantages of architectures like this is to well basically have a faster feedback for development. Um, you'll be able to um, develop your code faster because you will have, it will have less impact, and uh, it will also in production isolate the failures. So one service failure won't bring down the entire system. Um, it makes systems easier to reason about when onboarding people. It's just they only maybe work with one small part of the system rather than having to, to know all the implications of, um, uh, of changes. So that's the, the broad concept. Um, just to actually explain a bit about, about this talk is that's a, a bit of a shortened version of a talk that I've done um, at a Docker meetup uh, a few months ago. So there's a lot more to tell about microservices. There is a lot more to tell about Docker, but I'm mostly going to be, be uh, talking about the service discovery aspect. Um, I will share the slides of the other talk, and you're welcome to come talking to me afterwards um, if you have questions on the, on the first parts anyway. Um, so what does Docker have to do with, with any of this? Um, well, Docker is, is a framework in, in, in services that allows us to build, the ship, and to run distributed systems. Um, to sum it very quickly, um, it, it allows us to run very lightweight, um, well, you could call it lightweight VMs. Don't really like the term, but it's effectively VMs without hypervisor, without guest OS. It's just using the, the Linux containers um, architecture to run um, isolate, isolated processes right on the, on the, on the kernel. On the kernel. Um, containers are not new. Um, but what Docker brings is an entire ecosystem of building images, building um, and versioning them, uh, shipping them through registries, and basically allowing us to build a pipeline of deployment um, uh, with, with containers rather than shipping applications uh, as jars or as gems or, or these sort of things. So how do these things come together? I'm just going to take into an example what we do in Newsweaver for our development process and our deployment pipeline. So. I'm a developer, so I'm here coding. I'm, I have my service, I have my requirements. My code is finished. I push my code into a Git repository, which for us is, is stored in Stash, but it could just be like any, any Git repository that you have. Um, 
that you have locally. Uh, we have one Git repo for each of our microservices, which will be so that our microservice will be built in the build server. So we're using Bamboo, we're using all the Atlassian suite, but you could be using Jenkins, um, which is like another big one. And the result of Bamboo, of the build, is not just a jar, if we're building, a, let's say, a Java application, it will be a Docker image. So Docker image is a way to specify a Docker container. And that Docker image will specify the OS, the environment, so all the binaries. So if it's Java, we might ship with it the version of Java. Um, we won't have to be worried about, oh, we have our jar, but we don't know what version of Java is in production. Well, everything is inside the Docker image. And it will have our application code, so our jar. Um, that, get pu that gets pushed automatically to an internal Docker registry that will store and version all our, all our containers, all our images. And from then on, we'll be able to actually deploy that image into our various environments. So typically, we might have three environments, like the, devel the, de the development environment, which might be very lightweight, just one server running the Docker daemon. Uh, that's the, the, the environment for very fast feedback. De develop something it automatically after the build, it's going to deploy the container. Staging environment for maybe more advanced, um, just N plus one deployment, so we only change one service rather than just looking at everything that's in progress. That will probably be hit more into QA before actually going to like, the real production environment that's going to be a lot more beefy. So um, the blue symbol in front of, of each environment is um, for Kubernetes that we're using internally. So it's Kubernetes is the, the framework developed by Google for orchestration of distributed deployments. Um, it will deal with all the kind of the orchestration problems such as scaling, um, rolling updates to just making sure that if one of the machine goes down, well, then the number of instances of a given service will be spawned again somewhere else when there's resources, all the kind of load balancing, these, these sorts of things. So when we're going to have our build automatically, it might deploy straight away onto our development um, environment, where maybe PM can just look at the changes that we've done. Then when we're happy with the story, we might just we might start moving the Docker image. So change one service, move the Docker image, trigger a rolling update that will take down the old service and slowly roll down to the new one into staging. and. Once we're happy, once acceptance and testing is all passed, then we move that to the production server. One very important thing here is that this Docker image is the exact same everywhere. It's the one that was built originally, and it's the same one that's pushed everywhere. So we have an immutability of what we actually send um, in each of those systems. And as I said, the, the environment is packaged with it. So we don't have to worry about version of Java that Oh, that was upgraded here, but not here, and suddenly we have problems in production that are inexplicable. So it's going to be much easier to reason about its end. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the broad concepts of where Docker fits in inside, um, inside our, our pipeline. So if we look a little bit closer now at our production system and what does that mean? So we have our service, well, let's say, imagine we have two services. So we have a service A and service B. And we say, well, my Docker container that has, that's running service A is going to be running four instances. So we say to Kubernetes, run this image on with a, with a replication factor of four. It's going to find pl space on the different machines and deploy it there. Then we say, OK, run three instances of B. I'm putting, in there, I'm putting them there. Then, well, immediately there's kind of the question of, well, no, that was kind of random. These two instances might need to talk to each other. When they start up, how do they discover, how do they discover so the, the instance? And well, now, if I had another one, how do I ensure that this new one is discovered? This new one can discover other ones. And especially in, in particular, that the load is going to be balanced between all the services. Because if I'm seeing that the service is under load for others, the whole application is under load, and I need more instances of the B, well, if I start one, I just want the one to start picking up pace, not just sit in the corner. And on the kind of opposite scale of the problems is, well, what if the server goes down? And if I had hard-coded the dependencies between the instances, then well, suddenly I have like maybe a, a quarter or a third of the requests that are going to a place that I won't be able to answer. So the global problems of, or the 
new challenges of the of an architecture with very small surfaces and variable and very uh, like variable number of, of them is that well they will have a short lifespan whether it's because we want to scale or it's because we have machines going down we have more chances of, of failures of individual failures hardware network so how do we locate them how do we load balance them and like what happens when an instance disappears so that's the broad concepts of the service discovery that doesn't exist if you just running one big application so the solution that we've set up internally, uh, we've started working with like microservices and con continuous deployments like this um, for now almost a year. And well, let's say frameworks and all these service, all the all services um, like Kubernetes were not as, let's say, advanced as they are today. And not like most of them were not even in like production mode. Like there was not even the 1.0. So uh, what we started looking at is a framework developed by the guys of, of Airbnb um, called SmartStack. That's based off um, two different programs called Synapse and Nerve, very small Ruby gems. And it's also uh, relying on Zookeeper and on uh, HAProxy. So that's the broad lines I'll explain. I'm going to explain into details uh, how do we deal with this. So to take kind of a, well, try and take a meaningful example, um, let's imagine Netflix. So we know now Netflix use microservices, and that's a very naive example, but just to kind of put pictures on, uh, on words. So let's imagine a, a situation where we have two services. So the two services are packaged into Docker images, it run into Docker containers. The first service is, like, say, a viewing history service. So let's say you're just going and um, looking at movies, watching movies, watching series. It's going to record everything that you watch. It has history. It, that's, all it, that's all it cares about. I watch something, it gets stored. And that's, that's all it does. So we can imagine easily that that might sit over uh, NoSQL or, uh, or Kafka or these kind of like large kind of big data stores where it doesn't matter about querying too much, which makes it ma matters about storing a lot. But, and that's what the, uh, this application is, that's what this service is going to do well. Just store everything. Just I watch this, I store it. Um, on the other hand, we might actually, well, you see a Netflix, when you go in and just tell you, you watch this, so maybe it'd be great that you watch also, like you might like also this show or this movie. So we don't want to code that, code that in the viewing history service because it's not what it's supposed to be. It's just supposed to store the, what you watched. So the reg creating a new service, so recommendation service that, well, doesn't know what you watched, but it knows that if you watch one thing, then you might be interested in watching another. You can walk past the seat if you want. So that, that goes back to the, the, the single responsibility aspect of, well, now the recommendation service is going to be able to find um, movies to watch, but now it needs to know what you watch. So this is where the viewing history is going to have a, an, an API expose is going to tell you, OK, from this user, um, but this user has watched this, now the recommendation service can just can walk away. So where does SmartStack and the service discovery come into play here is, well, we might have multiple instances of the viewing history, multiple instances of the recommendation service. So they need to find each other. For that, we're going to use Zookeeper, which is like a distributed, highly available um, key store, which will actually store all the discovery information. It's going to store the topo topology of our services. So how does that work? We're going to have two parts of it. So it's a, it's a publisher subscriber model where the services, when they start and uh, when they become alive and when they become available, they when they start, when they're available to receive requests, they're going to publish themselves to Zookeeper. And on the other hand, we're going to have Synapse on the services that need to consume other services to actually discover all, all what the, the services that they need. Once Synapse discovers a service, it's going to update a local HA proxy configuration that's going to act as an ambassador for the requests that are need that need to be um, well fulfilled for let's say the viewing history service. So that's the broad picture. I'm going to zoom in on each of the parts. So and that we're going to get into a bit more complex stuff. So don't hesitate to stop me if there's something I'm missing or if there's something that's that's not clear. Is everything okay so far for everybody? All right, great. 
So let's zoom in on the publishing part. So that's the first thing that happens. Service instance pops up. Now it needs to say, I'm here, I'm available, start sending me requests. So we have our Docker container here that exposes an API through the port 8080. We have our application here and we have Nerve here. That's kind of an important bit that Nerve is not inside the application. So that's the big thing that we don't want to sprinkle our code with service discovery logic. We do microservices so that, well, let's say we want to have a service that's very aimed at one purpose, maybe 500 lines, 1,000 line stops. But we don't want to add 1,000 lines of service discovery in it because otherwise our single responsibility is gone. So that's the important bit that this is outside and we just rely on it without actually knowing really how, what it does. So to make itself available, the viewing history needs to actually specify well, what service it provides, so its name, what IP it's on, what port it's on. And also specify uh, a, a, a health check endpoint, uh, which I'm going to come uh, back to in a second. So knowing all this, NERV will publish that information to Zookeeper and basically make public that this service is available, that we have an instance of the viewing history on IP 1111 port 8080. The health check is a bit of a bonus there that NERV will actually monitor constantly this, the state of, of our service. So let's imagine our service becomes overloaded. There's too many requests coming to it. The service might say, actually, no, I'm not, I'm not healthy anymore. That's just a simple HTTP endpoint that might returns 200, means I'm cool, send me a request. Um, starts returning 500, Nerve will say, OK, this guy is overloaded. Take it out of Zookeeper. And suddenly, it's taken out of the rotation. It's taken out of the, the available services. The application becomes healthier again. It, Nerve will publish it back. Um, one thing to note as well here is that Zookeeper doesn't store um, permanent information. It's, the nodes are ephemeral. So whenever you send information to Zookeeper, it needs to be permanently refreshed. Otherwise, it will go away. So one thing that it guarantees in that case is that if the entire container dies, Nerve won't have time to see that the health check is actually, or that the health check is gone. So what we, what we don't want is the information to remain in Zookeeper without actually taking it out. Um, so the TTL on the information inside Zookeeper will ensure that, well, if after five seconds, 10 seconds, that we can specify that, then the service will be taken out of the rotation. Obviously, that's a bit of a smell because there we might have five, 10 seconds where we still have a service that's there, but it's still a little bit of a ghost. Um, we have a solution for that afterwards. So that's the publishing part. Now let's look at the actual discovery part. So we have a recommendation service um, on a different IP here, similar model. We have our application code that might be a jar, that might be JavaScript if we were using Node. Um, and similarly, we have Synapse and we have HAProxy inside. That, again, that big block, block is uh, a Docker container. And still Zookeeper. Same Zookeeper quorum, and we have our viewing history service here that we just advertised. Same story, we, we had a configuration file that will actually now say, what do I need? Synapse is there to discover services that it needs. So the recommendation service will say, I need the viewing history. And it will say, map this to port 9000. I'm going to come back to that in a second uh, for, for what it means. So as you can guess, Synapse goes to Zookeeper and says, I need the viewing history. And this is bi-directional because Zookeeper allows you to set up watches, which means that anytime something is going to change, Zookeeper will notify Synapse. They're saying, there's a new instance or there's an, like, there, an instance is gone. You need to be aware. You, just not, you need to stop sending requests to, to, to this instance. So previous slide. This, the, um, this service advertised itself and puts itself into Zookeeper via Nerve. Now, Zookeeper knows that while the viewing history has an instance on, on, this, on this address and on this port, so it passes that into Synapse, and Synapse will update uh, HAProxy to add a backend um, with this given IP, and it will expose that locally to this port 9000 that I was talking about before. So 
the really elegant thing here is that, well, the recommendation service and the application code here actually doesn't even know it's distributed. It will just talk to a local port and say, well, I know that because of my configuration, the viewing history is on this port, so I'm just going to talk straight to it, straight to, to my local port, thinking that, well, the viewing history sits just there. HAProxy will, uh, will actually forward this to an instance, and as you can see here, that's an array. So if we had multiple ones here, we'll end up with multiple ones here, multiple ones here, and HAProxy has like loads of possibilities to do um, round robin or load balancing. Uh, we could imagine doing load balancing based on locality. So if you have different kind of Docker servers um, or Docker machines, then you might be able to recognize from the IP where you should send your traffic rather than sending it across data centers, these, these sort of things. And we still have our problem with our TTL inside Zookeeper that, well, what if this dies and it doesn't, it is, doesn't um, come out to Zookeeper until like 10 seconds, then we might be 10 seconds still sending requests and not getting any answer. Well, HA proxy can bypass the entire thing and actually also verify that the backends that it has are actually reachable. So not only that solves our problem because we can ping every 500 milliseconds, so suddenly after we only have 500 milliseconds of while well, the service not being well, actually being unreachable, but it also solves problem with like split network scenarios where, well, some service advertise themselves, they all have, they all can reach Zookeeper, but they actually can't talk to each other. Um, so it's it's a big bonus and actually solves a lot a lot of headaches. Um, so what does that look like inside Docker? So Docker is Docker images are built with layers. We create different layers and then we can actually save them and start from them from then from them again to actually build more and more advanced and more and richer images. So when we specify a Docker file, we specify a base image. So we might start with let's say a Ubuntu image or maybe something a little bit smaller. Um, then Synapse and Nerve are gems. So we'd need to install Ruby inside it and HAProxy, which will be used for the um, for the routing and for the, the ambassador part. And we need, just need two kind of small custom scripts that are going to start Synapse and start Nerve. So that constitutes there a base image. We can build the image as far as here, and we have a smart stack base. What we call smart stack is the, the name of the entire framework. Um, and you can see here that it's not really related to any tech. It's not related to Java. It's not. It's 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 completely agnostic to what kind of tech you're going to be using afterwards. But it has all the bits you need for service discovery. So let's say you have services written in Java. So now you can start another image, starting from that base, add Java onto it, then add the service. So your service .jar that you built with Maven, Gradle, whatever, your Synapse configuration and your Nerve configuration, um, and or because, um, well, the previous examples were showing one with Synapse and one with Nerve, but you can pretty easily conceive that you could have the both inside here because obviously some services need to be discovered and also need to discover um, other services. It's not just a one, one thing. So it's possible to have the two, and more often than not, you will have the two. And we have a quick startup script that will just wire everything up together, figure out which IP is which, and just start the whole thing. So. There we have another layer, which is our smart stack with Java. And we can stop here and publish this image. And every time we have a Java service, we can only just start from here, name this, name this image smart stack with Java, and then say, no, I'm only adding these three bits. So you have another service that is in Java. You don't have to do the whole thing again. It's, it's, it is all saved. So, and then yeah, we have our service code and our configuration. So this only the specific bits that you need to be aware of. Come on a new tech. You start from here, you add your node, you have your node image, and then you add only your service specific code. What does that look like for a Docker file? So if for any of you that's uh, familiar with Docker, do the Docker file is just specified with just instructions one by one of like where the base is. So smart stack Java is here. So you already have all this just by doing from smart stack Java. So this image is available on, on, the Docker, um, uh, on the Docker Hub. Then we add our configuration. So the, the Nerve configurations is who I am, where am I, 
and we had the Synapse configuration is, who do I need? Um, then we had our core logic of our service, so it's just really what the service is supposed to do. And then we had our script, um, our startup script, and we start. So startup script is pretty basic. It's just we start Synapse, start Nerve, and then we start our service. Um, Common line, pretty simple. We build our service, and then we just run it. The only thing that we need to pass into the service that's kind of obvious is, well, where is ZooKeeper? Because, well, both services need to actually know. I have a common ZooKeeper quorum, so here we have two different nodes. It works with one or with more, etc. cetera. So, um, everything clear? Do I need to sum back up something? Or? Okay, so let's have a quick look at demo. Um, so obviously when service discovery works, it's not really visual because when well, we start multiple instances and things work. <laughs> so um, so that we actually see things, I'm going to, I try to do something based on colors. So that's very naive. We have one color UI service that is there to, well, display colors, but unfortunately, it's only responsible for displaying them. It doesn't know about colors. So we have another service that just knows about colors, so color service. And well, to make things visual and to be able to see the kind of low balancing, round robining uh, part of things is, well, whenever the color service starts, it's just gonna pick one color, and every time it's asked for a color, it's just gonna respond always with the same. So let's say we start three instances. One of them is always gonna res respond blue, second one red, third one green. So color UI service contains Synapse with a configuration saying, I need color services. And the color service is gonna contain a nerve configuration and it's gonna start nerve to say, um, I'm the color service, I'm here, I'm ready to receive requests. So everything starts, magic happens, uh, color UI service discovers all the services. And when it sends a, um, a just an API request, just an HTTP request to the color service, it gets blue, it displays blue. Um, as you can imagine, if it starts sending it to the other ones, it's gonna start rolling around to the to different colors. So let's see that in practice. So is it big enough there? You can see, yeah. So I have nothing running um, in on, on my machine in Docker. So I don't have ZooKeeper running on my machine, so I'm gonna use the Docker image to start ZooKeeper. So it's pretty simple. I'm just gonna run, so a demonized Docker image that I am exposing the ZooKeeper port. So now I have, it's not 41 minutes though. Okay, so I have one image here that's up for seven seconds. Now, what I need to do is start an instance of the color UI service. So, and I want to expose this on the, the Docker host on port 80. And I need to specify um, where my zookeeper is. So I just exposed, um, Zookeeper on port 2181 through the Docker host. So let's boot to Docker, so hence this IP. Uh, that's it. Okay, so now I have my two images, and if I go to port 80, now I get my color UI service, but as you can guess, there is no color service, so it's not able to display any colors. So now let's start a color service and see what happens. So we don't need to export, expose any ports for this service because, well, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be talking to um, only through the Docker network. So similarly, we need to specify where is the uh, ZooKeeper. It's going to be doing all the discovery, uh, all the discovery storage. Um, so.
So there we have now we have three. And well now it's actually well it's very visual now. It's supposed to be mint cream. Even on my screen it doesn't see like it. So we have one that's been discovered pretty quickly. So now let's start another one and see what happens. So now Nerve is gonna start checking the health checks and after three successful health checks he's gonna start. Every time I do this demo, the, the, the colors are the weirdest possible. So <laughs> thankfully I put the name on it. So now we have two that are gonna be alternating um, through um, just because it's just like all it is is an Ajax call that's just gonna go back to a node backend. It's just gonna be doing um, a get request. So now let's hope for a more visual color on the third one. Um, so as I was saying, after three successful health checks, Nerve will add the information to Zookeeper. Zookeeper will trigger a watch for the other one. For the, it will trigger a watch to the, um, for the color UI service, which is in Node. And now that's going to be added into rotation. And the code in, inside the service doesn't care. All it does is talk to the local host and to, to that port. And HAProxy will do all the work. So now that's all happy stuff. It's working when we're adding them. So let's see what happens when we remove them. So let's remove the last one that we created. So now we should have removed the yellow one. And now it's back only go rolling through, through, through those two. And we didn't have any uh, downtime. It didn't actually stop refreshing. It, it took everything out straight away. So here it's the actual uh, HA proxy ping that, that helped us because killing the container would just have killed Nerve and Nerve wouldn't have time, wouldn't have had time to, to remove the instance. Okay, so all this demo is available on GitHub. So all the code is available, but you don't even need to build anything because all the images are actually on Docker Hub as well. So start, you can do the exact same thing as I did. All these images are on Docker Hub. Start Zookeeper, start the UI, start services, play around, take them down, start more. Um, there's not much to it, so it gets boring pretty quickly. <laughs> but it will show you that it's like, the nice immutability of things is that I created the images, I built them, and wherever you actually want to run them, it will actually have the exact same effect. So that's kind of it for, for me today. Um, a bit more reading if you're kind of on the journey already or starting on the journey of microservices. Is the, um, the, the Sam Newman book, Building Microservices, is like definitely a must read. Um, it goes over all the main concepts that you need to be worried about, the monitoring, the discovery, um, API design, like where to find boundaries for your microservices. Um, it's like authentication, like all, all the sorts of things that, well, you only start thinking about when you start designing those, uh, the microservices or the monolithic applications. Um, domain driven design, a bit of an older book, but that's kind of back on the scene now, uh, especially with microservices and kind of designing the boundaries of the context for each of your services, as in, if you come back from, if you come from a monolithic application, well, how do you decide where the boundaries are? How do you decide what, what's a microservice and why is it split here right, and, not, and not here? So um, similar, good, good read, a bit harder to read than, than building microservices. And finally, continuous delivery. I mean, if you go and do microservices and you don't do continuous delivery, I'm not sure why you would do microservices. Um, personally, I mean, for us in Newsweaver, we don't do microservices for scaling. We do it for the agility that it gives us for delivering stuff really quickly, getting out of four week sprints where we actually have something coded in two days, but we have to wait two months for actually getting live. Um, this, like, that's the real bonus, um, I think, for a lot of people starting on, the, on this journey. Um, all right, so any questions? I would, I would also direct you to our tech blog um, where we publish a good bit of, good few articles on this and also on um, a good bit of um, DevOps, of Ansible, of um, big data with Cassandra and Spark. Um, and yeah, a lot of 
loads of articles, uh, loads of very good, good people writing them. Um, and if any questions, go for it, or don't hesitate to ping me on Twitter if you have a question later. Hi. Hi. Uh, that was good, thanks. Um, one question I had was, uh, what else did you look at apart from SmartStack? Uh, why did you oh, yeah, that's one thing. That's one of the things I want to mention. Yeah. So um, this is well, as I said, is we started on this uh, a year ago, where a lot of texts were not as mature as they are now. Um, honestly, if we started now, we probably would be looking at Kubernetes, or, uh, the Kubernetes services, um, which which are well, Kubernetes is now um, production ready. It's 1.0. Um, the API is much more mature than it was a year ago, and I think it probably would be a more solid approach um, and even more decoupled because then we would actually <coughs> take all the discovery outside of our containers and it would all be dealt with by Kubernetes. Um, one of the reasons we still like this solution right now is that if we want to run this locally, we don't, we don't need uh, the whole Kubernetes cluster. We can actually just start Zookeeper, start a few services and discover each other even on our local machines. So that's an added bonus um, to actually be able to still have the, the, the discovery here. Um, yeah, so that kind of answers that, that question, I suppose, yeah. What's Swarm these days? Is Swarm the same space as Kubernetes? Um, not exactly. I mean, Swarm will allow you to, um, is it multi-machines now? Yeah, Swarm allows you to do stuff on, on different machines. Um, it, won't, it won't have uh, the, same power, the same power as Kubernetes. Uh, Docker kind of was a bit late and to adding all those tools, like when they added uh, Compose, uh, which was Fig, Swarm, and Machine, um, it won't allow you to do the same things. Um, it won't have the same uh, power of, I suppose, the definition of like a large-scale system with like a lot of machines and all the redundancies, all the scaling. Um, it, like all the Docker ecosystem, it's it's kind of pick and choose what you want. You can build a solution with Swarm and. I probably would advise people who are starting probably not to start with Kubernetes because that's like that's already the pretty big steam engine for for the for probably a small problem. You could even just use Compose at the very start. Um, so it's similar space, but everybody went onto the, the Docker journey last year, and there was no tools available, so everybody built their own ones, and now there's loads of tools for loads of things that are, are overlapping each other. Um, so we haven't used Swarm uh, ourselves anyway. But There's one other variation, yeah. Mesos, where does that fit into the picture versus Kubernetes? Yeah, with Mesos you'll have Marathon that will do something similar to the discovery. Uh, Mesos, you can run Kubernetes on Mesos as well. Um, it's, it's Loads of different combinations. We haven't tried Mesos. I think this is one thing that's on our agenda uh, for Spark as well, because we're using we're using Spark. So for it's again that comes in the picture, but it's going to be something that solves some problems that are already solved. So yeah. So how does the that issue that you were mentioning, like if Nerf didn't get didn't ping, uh Zookeeper fast enough, and Zookeeper takes the services down, so it takes it out. Uh, would Nerf, like, when, when, whenever Nerf notifies Zookeeper, it was just, like, would be fast enough to just restart the service or something like that? Well, so. Nerf will notify uh, Zookeeper very quickly. The TTL is very long, so it's it, it would be like 10 seconds for Zookeeper to start deleting information, and Nerf will ping very quickly. So. If the service became, there's a difference between service becoming unhealthy, where something you can detect, and the service completely crashing. Service crashes, usually you're just going to kill the container, start another one, it's going to take a few milliseconds. So as you said, that would be much faster to do this this way. But we don't want, if the service is, I don't know, let's say, Treadpool is running low or something like that, and you just like you say, actually, just back off now and wait until I'm getting I'm getting healthier. You don't want to kill the service and potentially like kill some of the requests that would have come through. Um, but it's, I suppose, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, uh, and then, then like, the question, what, what, like, there are a lot of benefits to using Docker and stuff and microservices, but what are the pitfalls? Because I know that you can, might run into some performance issues, like, have you run into any of those issues or something like that? How do you approach them? You mean performance and latency, maybe, or? Yeah, like, when you have, like, a lot of big microservices, like, that compared to, like, 
one of those big scale like uh, like co cobalt systems. We have like instead of microservices, you have everything in one place. Um, like you might run into some performance issues or something like that. Like a lot of a lot of microservices running at the same time, and a lot of endpoints are to be. Um, yeah. Well, it's. It, it all comes down to how you design your system, and that y you obviously, if like a badly designed microservice architecture is worse than a badly designed mon monolith, because all the problems that you would have will become exponentially multiplied because like services becoming chatty with each other, so loads of requests going on. That's a smell that maybe this should be a bit closer together. We have split some logic, so it's like. Um, Microservices are definitely not free. <laughs> it's not a free launch. It's like you're moving the complexity from one place to the other. Like before, the complexity was when things grow. Now the complexity is, well, how do you split things together? The complexity is spread across multiple services and we'll have more issues in terms of now we need to monitor things. Things is dif like distributed systems are complicated and un unfortunately, <laughs> microservices will be complicated because of this. Uh, so the pitfalls are you you have to do this um, with all these things in mind. You have to monitor things. You have to monitor performance. You have to mo monitor problems, um, failures. It's yeah. It's there's a, there's a lot there's a lot more to do than in another service. But when it's done well, then you kind of reap the rewards and you have fast feedback on the deployments. You have better uptime. It's we're starting to go live right now, and like we had, we had a lot of these problems. We had a lot of things to tackle, but it's really enjoyable when you can just make a change, like discover a bug, make a change, and for the change to be live in less than an hour, rather than having to wait like for four weeks.